With me today is my co-host Janelle Blue. Janelle is president of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society and we decided before we get into our topic that we would first tell you a little bit about Mount Vernon because we haven't done that. So Janelle, would you like to tell us about the society? Yes, I'd be glad to. We are a nonprofit organization. We have about 300 members and we're here located in, in the Alexandria area. Our goal is to educate and to provide a community for people who are interested in genealogy. And that includes beginners as well as experienced researchers. Our monthly meetings are the third Tuesday of every month. And at the meetings, we always have a prominent speaker who talks on a variety, a variety of different subjects. Um, we, in addition, we have small, small group training and we have special interest groups as well. Um, we encourage you to visit our website at mvgenealogy.org, where you will see a lot more about what we do as well as the upcoming presentations that we have. If you're a member, you would also have, a, have the opportunity to uh, view some of the past present, uh, presentations uh, because we, we do record those, and, and uh, so you would see it on a digital basis. Um, also, there's an electronic newsletter, which is yes. really helpful and has a lot of information as well as articles and so forth. So we are located at uh, 1500 Shenandoah Road. We are um, open to, uh, and we welcome you if you would like to come. We hope you would consider uh, becoming a member, but you are certainly welcome to come and visit. Um, as Chuck reminded me to say, um, you know, you don't have to have Virginia ancestors to, to be interested in a local genealogy society because we do a lot of things that are not Virginia-based. And if you come to our research center, which is located at the Shenandoah Road um, location, you're going to find a lot of references, a lot of books, history, uh, genealogy-based. Uh, we also have computers, we have access to databases, and we have volunteers who will help you through that. And especially if you are beginning uh, your, your genealogical journey and you want to um, have a place to come with some people to help you, this is a, a good opportunity for you. So you're certainly welcome. Just to give them an idea, we actually meet in the Holland Hall Senior Center, which is around the corner from Mount Vernon Hospital and kind of off of Fort Hunt Road between the GW Parkway and Route 1. So it's not very hard to find mm -hmm. us. So the topic that we've decided to do today is talking about the genealogical proof standard. The prior to the proof standard coming around 20 years ago, genealogists used the legal term preponderance of the evidence, which was you have a case that you have evidence that you weigh it. And whatever has the greater evidence usually was what was accepted. Well, this was a legal term. And certainly there have been cases in history that at the time the evidence stacked up against the person or for the person, depending on what the case may be, and they were found guilty or not guilty. And later those cases may have been overturned. And we kind of have used that, and I think about deciding to determine where my grandmother was born because she used to say New York or she said New Jersey back and forth. And if I took the records and the number of records that said New York versus the ones in New Jersey, I would have said, well, she was born in New York. But when I follow the proof standard, I find, no, she really was born in New Jersey, although she created more records saying she was born in New York. So the proof standard is actually a five-step process, and we're going to have a slide here in a minute. The first one is we conduct a reasonably exhaustive search for all the information that is or may be pertinent to the identity, the relationship, the event, or the situation in question. So we're gathering 
everything that we possibly can. And I find that people often get hung up on what is a reasonably exhaustive search. We look for all the records that we can possibly find that are going to help us answer the question that we have. But we may find in our search that records get lost. I've been in the Fairfax County Courthouse. They've had both deed books and will books who have grown little feet and walked out of the courthouse and aren't there. So we may not be able to find them. Uh, it may be that they are restricted. We think about the census. It's covered under a 72-year privacy restriction, so we can only look at censuses that are 72 years old or older. So that's why many of us are waiting anxiously for 2022 when the 1950 census comes out and we will appear. And also it may be something that it's costly to get a copy of the record and will it really help you? So one of the things we have to do is look at what is in the record. Are we going to find something that's going to help us? And then determine if it's going to help us, we may spend the money. But if it's not going to help us, it might not be worth it. Well, also, it reasonably exhaustive means different things. And, and one of the things that's important is to, to look at the records that you have to determine the quality of those yes. records. Because, you know, there's a difference whether the record is an original, whether it's a derivative, whether it directly answers the question that you have. Um, where did it, you know, who, who provided the information? And so depending on the strength of okay. those records, then you may have to have a lot more. You may have to search further than you would have normally. If you have three records that all are originals, they all answer directly the question, then you can probably feel pretty comfortable that, that you've got what you need. But in my case, and in many cases, you're not getting that. You're getting yes. some sort of indirect uh, way to, to get that answer to your question. And therefore, the, you need to have a lot more. Yeah, and, and we really do have to, when we examine the record, we really have to determine the quality, like you said, uh, is the evidence direct? Is it indirect? Who gave the information? And, you know, I, I think back to uh, a student for a course, the National Genealogic Society's home study course that I have been a grader for for a long time. We had someone who sent in three different birth certificates for a family member. Each one of them was one that had come from the Department of Vital Records in the state where they were coming from. Each one was the information copied onto a form and then certified by the clerk that it was a true and accurate copy. And each one of them had a fact that differed from the other two copies, even though they were supposed to be an exact copy. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at all of that. We have to use each fact in determining what we're doing. We don't look at the whole certificate just as a whole, we have to determine who who gave the information. You know, do we have more than one copy, and is is the information the same on each one? And if not, we've got some work to do. I often use my two grandfathers' death certificates. My mother's father's death certificate has the wrong father on there. My grandfather's father was not John D. He was Alexander, and my grandfather was named after his father, and everybody that, that really was around my grandfather knew that. My mother's brother was the informant on the certificate. I don't know where he got John D. from. And then I have my father's father's death certificate. All the information right down to the little town that he was born in is correct on there. And my aunt's husband, a son-in-law, gave the information. So we really have to examine it. 
I have a very similar situation. And, but, you know, when you think about it, when someone dies, then, you know, there's a lot of other things going on and people aren't thinking clearly sometimes when they get, give that information. And so that's how we wind up with all of this strange, strange. information. I, I just want to interject this one thing. Dr. Tom Jones, who is, who is a prominent researcher, author, lecturer, and has written the, one of the books on, um, on the genealogical proof standard has, he says that um, a thorough research reduces the probability that new found evidence will overturn a proved conclusion. And that if you do find new evidence, it's more likely to support it rather than overturn it. So that's, that's the overlying Yes. Um, idea about the proof standard that you've done so much that nothing you you do in the future is going to overturn that. And you know one of the one of the things that people often do ask about this and and have asked when when we use the old preponderance of the evidence is how many sources do you need? You know, do you need two, four, ten? You know. Well, it's hard to say how many sources there may be. So you really want to definitely look at anything that might answer the question, but usually at least at a minimum, you want two independent sources. So that is going to be two documents or two records that come from two different completely independent sources. So, you know, it's not something that you have the census and then maybe somebody took information from the census and created something. You don't have two independent records then. You, you have two related sources. And those two cannot be the family tree on ancestry, ancestry. and find a grave. That, yes. th those don't count. Yes. Yes, we, we really, you know, Ancestry and Find a Grave and other online sources are great clues to things, right. but we really have to look at the information. Uh, I have, have a family member, distant family member, who has information on both of those sources and also on Family Search. And she has misinformation that I have proven to her with actual records. Mm -hmm. I went and got the pension file and have proven to her that the second great-grandfather that we share is not the Civil War veteran. It's his son with the same name. Mm -hmm. But she has still continued, even with the proof in black and white, to spread that information or misinformation. Right. So, you know, then moving on uh, in the process here, we collect and include in our compilation a complete and accurate source citation to the source or sources of each item of information that we have used. So this is creating a source citation. Where did we get the information? And the purpose of that is for a couple of things. Number one, so we can go back and find the source. But number two, so other people will know where we got it. They can go back to the source and look at the source, examine the source, and see if they come to the same conclusion that we have come to. And there's sort of two parts to um, a citation, so be careful if you're just getting it online, because you really yes. want to add, to add the the source of the, the the original source of the information, who actually originated it, when and where did that happen, and then you can talk about where you found it on Ancestry, if that if that in case in the case also or maybe it's Family Search. Um, Put the URL, but remember that URLs change often. And so maybe three years from now, you want to go back and look at it again, and the URL's broken for some reason. So, so that's why it's important to have as much information as you can in the citation so that you can go back, that either you can go back 
and, and do more work or someone else can pick it up. Uh, one, one of the important things that, that I see in uh, publications like the National Genealogical Society's Quarterly and others, when people use websites, they put the date that they access the information right. so right. That, that you know at that date it was working. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things I have talked to a couple of archive staff members and many, many of the source citations that you find on websites, if you took that source citation down to the National Archives and said, I want to find this record, they can't use it because the online sources do not put enough information on there for you to go back and actually find the record that you're, you're looking at or that you need to look at. And then the third part of our, our uh, process here is probably one of the most important ones. We analyze and uh, we collate and collect the information to assess its quality as evidence. So we are looking at, as I said before, each piece of the record. We take it independently and look at it and evaluate it for its accuracy. Does it make sense? Does it match or does it back up things that we have found in other records or is it something different that we then need to go and analyze and, and work on possibly finding even yet another source that's going to, to help to verify that information? So I have a, a genealogical question that I've been trying to resolve. And by the way, that's, that's what you need to begin with is just, just figure out what your question is because if you try to do a scattershot, you're, yes. you're just going to have a whole lot of information and you can't really do a lot with that much information at one time. So my genealogical question was, who was the father of my great-grandfather? Who was his father? And my great-grandfather's name was John Ogeman. And we just talked about death certificates and how sometimes they are unreliable. His son, he, his son said, oh, his grandfather's name was John. So everybody in the family has always thought that John Ogeman's father's name was John. And, um, and that's on all the family trees and other things. Well, it turns out that by doing the, the analysis, by doing the co uh, comparison, by researching that John, the, the ancestor, no, that wasn't, that wasn't the father. That John only had two daughters. And it, they were related, it turns out, but they, it wasn't the right person. And so that's why the analysis and the comparison, and by the way, I still haven't found any other record that states the name of his father. So then I have to go into um, looking at indirect information, Should. all of the other actually negative information uh, to try to solve this, and I haven't quite gotten there yet. There yet. And then the fourth part is what we were just talking about. We resolve any conflicts caused by items of evidence that contradict each other or are contrary to our proposed or hypothetical solution to the question. You know, I tell my students when, when I teach uh, problem resolving, number one, you don't want to ask the broad question. I want to know everything about my family. Mm -hmm. You break it down into individual. I want to know who the parents were. I want to know when they were born, where they were born, when they were married, where, you know, whatever the question is. And we find the evidence to, to do the analysis. But then we have conflicting information. Going back to my grandmother's birthplace, you know, I had more evidence that she was born in New York from records that she created. So to really resolve that problem, I had to look at each piece of evidence, but I also looked at the extended family. Where were all of her siblings? Mm -hmm. And there were supposedly eight of them. I found seven. There's one that 
according to the census record uh, where my grand, great grandmother gave the information, she had a child that died young evidently and I can't find anything on that child, but I looked at all of her siblings and the records that I could get for them and I decided based on that, that New York was the wrong place. All of her siblings were born in New Jersey. I could find no reason why her mother would have been in New York, to have given birth in New York, particularly on a military base mm -hmm. that my grandmother said in one record she was born on. So we have to resolve that to finally come back to a, uh, a conclusion. conclusion. Yeah. And then finally, is um, the you have to put all this together in some sort of written statement and if you don't do that it's lost uh, someone once said that all of the research has been done at one time or another but it was never written down yeah. and so we do it over and over and over again and um, the the written document needs to include your logic how did you come to the conclusion um, and and what is perhaps what is the next step if there is something left that needs to be done? That document should include all your citations, and then you can use that either for your own research. Maybe you want to pick it up again five years later, or maybe your descendants want to use yes. it. And if it's really well written, and and if you really follow a genealogical proof standard, give it to a library so that others can also be able to have access to that information. Yeah, and that, that is our, our final step in the process, but that's not necessarily the end of things. You write it up, you know, share it with, with everybody, and particularly if you can get it out where people who, who are doing the research may be a distant family member because they can look at it and then they may have something that we don't have that could come back and, and cause us to reevaluate things. Whenever we find new evidence, we need to go back and reevaluate that evidence. It may be that it does back up our conclusion and then again, it may be something that leads us down a different path but you know, writing it up and getting it published is one of one of the great ways of, of sharing information. Uh, but you don't have to have a conclusion. It no, may be that it, everything you did it may left be, the a question unanswered, and that's yes, okay too. And that's that's okay. <laughs> it, it's you know, unfortunately, not every problem can we resolve. Mm. We we really do have to to. Uh, take it to the point that we can hopefully we find a resolution but you know it doesn't always happen well in the case of my John Ogeman I I'm not sure if I'm ever going to find it I have one clue that tells me that the his land grant was then given to the widow and the heirs but those, and I know, I know my grandfather is in there, but it doesn't say his name. name. It doesn't and, tell you who the heirs and it are. it <laughs> never says who the widow is in anything except one census where it says the mother, but they're living in a stepfather's house by that time. Right. So then there's that question too. So all of the research I've done and I write it up, but there's no conclusion at this point. There's just more action steps perhaps to follow. And so we're always, like we said, going out looking for additional information, things that, that may help. There, there may be that, that magic record out there that we just haven't, haven't been able to find. And that's where DNA can come in too. That's, and, that's, and that's where I'm headed now, is to try to, to get more information from potential cousins. Yes, and, and that DNA has been a big boost to, to solving some of these problems. Uh, my grandfather had a younger brother who left home. Family had two postcards from him, postmarked Erie, Pennsylvania, that were sent to my great-grandmother shortly after he left home, saying, I'm fine, 
and that's the last we heard of him. I have tried to resolve the problem as has others and just recently, about a month ago now, had a distant uh, cousin contact me. Someone has done DNA research and we have found my grandfather's Great. younger brother. Great. And you know, he did what I suspected he did. He changed his name. Fortunately, he didn't change all the facts about his life, just what his surname is. And so now we have him. Uh, and I've got a new avenue to explore because I want to find out all about him. So we hope that this will be something that will help you in your research. And particularly if you're beginners, I wish as a beginner I had really had the proof standard rather than preponderance of the evidence to get started with because a lot of the work that I did I probably would have done differently if it had had been around for me. And, and one last tip, keep track of everything you look at. Yes. Just keep your own log and, and keep track so you don't keep doing it over yes. and over. And that, that source citation is so important. Um, I have a wife for a great uncle that I don't know where I found the information. Mm -hmm. And I found out later, he never married. So <laughs> I don't know where Zelda came from, but <laughs> she, she came from something I looked at, but it was before I even knew the importance <laughs> of source citation. So, so again, we hope that this does help you and good luck with your research.